as it was, so it is, and evermore shall be. As it was, so it is now, and evermore shall be. So what are you you talking about? Lots of things. There's lots of things in life that are just the way that they are. It's the way life is. It was that way. It is that way. It will be that way. It's true of success. If you want to be successful, you will have to work really, really, really hard at whatever you want to be successful in. As it was, so it is, and evermore shall be. Now, you say, well, I know people that are successful that didn't work very hard. And you say, I don't think you do. You might know people that are wealthy that didn't work very hard because someone gave them their wealth. But to become successful at anything, it will take a lot of work. An author named Malcolm Gladwell wrote a book called Outliers, The Story of Success. And in this book, he talks about how to become really good at something, truly successful, it just takes about 10,000 hours of practice. 10,000 hours of doing the same thing again and again and again. And then you're a successful piano player. Then you're a successful parent. Then you're a successful teacher. It takes huge amounts of time to be successful. It's always been that way. It is that way now. And it will be that way forevermore. You want to have good friendships. Be trustworthy and faithful. If you are not trustworthy and faithful, you will not have good friendships. As it has been, so it is now, and it evermore will be. Good relationships, good friendships demand that we be trustworthy and faithful and how we relate to people, and that will lead to stronger relationships. Let's take this to the spiritual realm. As it was, so it is now, and it evermore will be. Here's a truth that doesn't change. If you want to follow Yahweh, the God of the Bible, the one living God, it will cost you. It will cost you. You will be called to sacrifice and lay things down as it was, so it is now, and evermore shall be. If you're going to truly follow God, it will cost you something. And if you follow him him closely, it will cost you more. More than you imagine or dream. It's been true from the beginning. Abraham, God called Abraham to follow him. And Abraham left his homeland, left his family, left everything he knew. It cost him to follow God. Joseph was faithful to God in a foreign land. He stood morally strong and followed God's will, and he ended up being thrown in jail for it. Why is that? Because when you follow God, it costs something. Jeremiah The prophet was faithful to speak the words of God, and he was called the weeping prophet. It cost him his own heart. It broke his heart seeing people resist the will of God. The Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul at the end of his life had 195 scars covering his body because five times he received the 40 lashes less one. Five times they strapped him up and beat him 39 times within an inch of his life. It costs when you choose to follow the will of God. Our Savior, Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, our God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, God the Son, as he walked in obedience to the will of the Father, was nailed to a cross for your sins, for my sins. It costs something to follow after God. And Jesus said, if you want to be my follower... Here's part of the deal. Just deny yourself every day. Take up your cross and be ready to die and be crucified and walk in my ways. If you're not counting the cost, if you're not feeling the cost and the pain of walking close to Jesus, I ask the question, are you walking closely to him? Are you walking passionately and living for him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? Because as it was, it is now, and evermore will be. To follow after Jesus is to take up a cross. You will be called to sacrifice. You will be called to lay something down. And this was absolutely true for Elisha. Elisha the prophet. You study any great character of the Bible, and you're going to see that they laid something down to follow after God. And so in Elisha's story, we spent two, two weeks looking at Elijah. Now we look at Elisha. 
Elijah's protege. And, and Elisha didn't follow Elijah. Elisha followed Yahweh. He just learned how to follow Yahweh by watching Elijah. And as he followed God's will, it cost him something. I will share with you that in the preparation for the sermon, one of the things I was saying, I always say to God when I prepare a sermon, Lord, what do you want to say to me? I'm not just learning from his word to teach other people. God speaks to my heart first. And two different times in my preparation for this sermon, God said to me, and Kevin, by the way, here's the sacrifice you need to make. Here's something you need to lay down. Here's something you need to leave behind. And in both cases, I did what I always do when I feel like God calls me to sacrifice something. I, I, I looked at it and thought, I don't know if I want to. I don't know if I'm ready to. But this is what I also did. I looked back through my life at all the things that God has called me to lay down and sacrifice to follow him. And I don't regret a single moment I laid something down for the sake of Jesus, not once. Not when I get far enough down the road and can look back and see what God can do through a person who chooses to follow close enough to sacrifice and lay their life down for Jesus Christ. So when we look at the life of Elisha, it should not shock us that he was called to follow God and it cost something. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 19. And in 1 Kings chapter 19, if you have your phone or your, your iPad, you just, just open up your Bible app and go to 1 Kings chapter 19. And I want you to hear the story of Elijah coming to Elisha and God through Elijah calling Elisha to follow. I want you to notice what happens in this story. Because right at the moment of the call, there was already a call to sacrifice. 1 Kings chapter 19, beginning in verse 19. 1 Kings 19, 19. So Elijah went from there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat. He was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the 12th pair. Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him. Elisha then left his oxen and ran after Elijah. It's clear that Elijah put the cloak over him and started walking away. And Elisha stopped, chased him down, ran after Elijah. And he says this. It's a strange thing to say. This guy's come by, put a cloak on his shoulders, and he says, let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, he said, and then I will come with you. So there was something in that placing of that cloak that meant something to him. We'll, we'll get a sense of that background because in the ancient world, it meant something to us. We have to understand what it meant back then. And here's the response. Go back, Elijah replied. What have I done to you? You know what Elijah is saying? He's saying, Elisha, you need to understand, I'm not calling you. This is God. God may use a person, but when God calls, it's God. Go back, Elijah replied. What have I done to you? So Elisha left him and went back. He took his yoke of oxen and slaughtered them and burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat and gave it to the people, a public declaration, and they ate. Then he set out to follow Elijah and became his servant. When Elisha followed the call of God, when Elisha went to learn from Elijah and step into this ministry, he moved where Elijah went. He began to travel. There were no phones. There wasn't a mail service. There was no FaceTime. Hey, folks, how you doing? I can see you. I can talk to you. Didn't exist back then. To follow God meant leaving everything behind. The moment he was called, there was a cost associated with it because there always is. And so I want to pause for a minute. And I want to ask you to dare to pray a quiet prayer in your heart. Would you quietly say to God right now, God, if you will speak to me, if you will lead me, nudge me, guide me, I'm ready to count the cost. I'm ready to make the sacrifice. I will lay down whatever you call me to lay down so that I can follow you and do your will in small ways and in big ways. I'm ready to follow whatever the cost. If that's the prayer of your heart, God is ready to speak to you. He is ready to nudge you and to guide you. And so let's look at Elisha's story. Let's learn from his journey because I believe it can speak to our hearts today. Here's the first thing we can notice. Elisha was living an ordinary day when he was called by an extraordinary God. What was Elisha doing when Elijah showed up and when God used Elijah to call him? What was he doing? He was at work. He was pushing a plow. He was breaking a sweat. He was working hard. He was just 
living a normal day. That is so often when God speaks. You may hear God speak through a sermon, praise the Lord. You may hear God speak through a great worship song, wonderful. You may hear God speak, but, but in the flow of your normal day, understand God can speak anytime, anywhere. Look at verse 19. So Elijah went from there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat. He was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving in the 12th pair. Uh, he wasn't a supervisor. He was in the trenches, in the muck fields, knee deep. He was working. He's plowing with 12 yoke of oxen. He's driving the 12th pair. And Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him. You have to get this picture. So Elijah comes, and he's got his mantle, his cloak. And he takes it, and he puts it over Elisha's shoulders. Now, that may not mean anything to us, but in the ancient world, there was a sense of, we have a term now, passing the mantle. You know where it came from? Here. Passing the mantle, pass, passing on. Elijah basically said, you know, my prophetic ministry, what I'm doing, I am now inviting you into that, to follow God, to serve God, and he puts the cloak over his shoulders. And Elisha knew exactly what it meant. I want to ask you a question. Are you paying attention to God's nudges and leading in the flow of your life? Do you pay attention just in the flow of your life? Well, I, I, I'm an at-home parent doing homeschooling. God can speak right in the middle of it. And he does. Do you pay attention? Are you listening? You're driving a truck making deliveries. That's what you do. I'm just doing my job. God wants to show up. Keep your ears open, keep your eyes open, keep your heart open, keep your life open, keep your schedule open, because God shows up in those moments. Are you paying attention? You're in law, you're in medicine, you're in education, whatever it is, in the flow of life, that's when God so often speaks. Are you paying attention to God's nudges and the leading in the flow of your life? Are you going through your day? And just in a little way. See, see, God speaks and guides us to big things, but he usually leads us to big things when we've been following him in the little things. So you're going through your day, and all of a sudden, this quiet whisper of the Holy Spirit says, hey, slow down and notice that person at your school, in your workplace, in your neighborhood. God says, just slow down and notice. They are hurting. They are lonely. They are broken. And I want you to slow down and look into their eyes and come alongside of them and offer to help. And you say, but God, that makes me uncomfortable and nervous. Exactly. <laughs> it costs something to follow Jesus, but I, I, I don't know what to say or what to do. Then Lord, give me wisdom. You can love, you can care, you can slow down. God opens those doors, he gives those nudges, and we can walk right past them or we can just slow down. You're, you're walking through your day. And you're around one of your kids. you got younger kids. And God says, slow down. Look into their eyes. Get a little closer, eye to eye with them. And give them five minutes saying, honey, how you doing? Where are you at? Or if they're a grown teenager, you can say, how you doing? What, you know, how you, but, but God nudges you. You're married. And you're busily going through your day doing your thing. And you're going from point A to point B. And your spouse is just someone who gets in the way where you're trying to get from place to place. And God says, slow down. Notice them. Take five minutes, ten minutes, and engage. How are you doing? How are we doing? How could I serve you? God will call you in those moments to respond. It costs something. It costs you keeping your schedule. And getting to exactly point A and point B when you planned on. It can cost you heartache. Because as you care and get close to people, you take on some of their pain. But it glorifies God. Maybe God calls you to a new way of living by, by saying, I love you, but this part of your life, this behavior, this pattern, it needs to end. This habit has got to stop. And God says, I want to work through you and work in your life, but I need you to look at this thing and deal with it. That may be the very thing that sets you up for the next thing God has for you. Are you paying attention to God's nudges and leading in the flow of life? And then we look at Elisha and his story, and we see this, that Elisha got the message, and when he was called, he moved. When Elisha heard the call, when Elijah came and placed the mantle on him, placed the cloak on him, he responded. Look at verse 20. 
Elisha then left his oxen and ran after Elijah. Let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, he said, and then I will come with you. He knew what Elijah was saying. He knew the message that God was bringing through Elijah. This placing of the cloak over his shoulders was saying to him, listen, your career in farming is over. You're now going to be, step into a prophetic ministry and follow Elijah. He got it. But I love this. He, he goes right to him and he says, let me say goodbye to my family. Now, don't begrudge him that. Don't, don't say, well, was he unfaithful? To, no, he's, he's not like he can check in in a couple of days on the phone. He's saying goodbye to his family, not knowing if he's ever going to see him again. You'd want a good son to say, let me say goodbye to my folks. Let me tell him, listen, God's given me a new call. I'm stepping into that, and I don't know when I'm going to see you again. As it was, it is, and evermore shall be. To follow God costs something. And when you make those sacrifices, and you look back one day, from far enough away, maybe from heaven... You never regret those sacrifices if you faithfully follow God into what he calls you to do. And so, a question for you. When God calls, are you ready to follow? Now, right when he calls. And what might hold you back? When God nudges you, when the Spirit whispers to you, when you hear a sermon or you're talking with somebody, all of a sudden you just feel this conviction of the Holy Spirit. It's time to stop this. It's time to start that. It's time, it's time to take this next step in my faith. Do you respond? Here's what I've learned from the, through the years. If my response to God when he calls is, I'll get to it tomorrow, that's my way of saying, Lord, not really interested. Because tomorrow becomes next week, and next week becomes next month, and it falls off the radar. The best time to respond to a leading of the Spirit and to God's prompting in your life is the moment you hear it, the moment that conviction comes, that encouragement comes, that word comes. And what might hold you back? What keeps you from responding when the Lord leads? When the Spirit whispers and says, you know, it's time, it's time to get back involved in serving and ministry in some way as a volunteer on Shoreline's campus in the community, but it's kind of time to give back. What gets in the way of that? When the Lord says, it's time to start opening up my word every day and sitting and, and reading the scriptures and making sacrifices some time to be with me, what gets in the way of that? What is it that keeps you from responding? Maybe it's just busyness. Lord, I'm busy. I got a lot going on. And God says, I know. <laughs> I run the universe. I got it. But I'm calling you. Maybe it's fear. I'm afraid to take that step. And what it costs you is stepping into something that makes you afraid. Maybe it's laziness. Lord, I'd like to, but, you know, I, I got to commit three hours every evening to playing my video games or watching Netflix. You know, Lord, you know that's important to me. The Lord says, I, I, I know, but, but I'm calling you. I'm leading you. And you may have to set something down to pick up what I'm giving to you. Maybe your excuse is this. Lord, who am I? Who am I? God calls you to love someone, to share his gospel, to serve in some way. And you say, Lord, who am I? You know what God says? I know who you are. While you are in the depths of your sin, I sent my only son for you, to die for you, to give his life for you. I know exactly who you are. And I'm calling you. Has it ever struck you that the only people God has to use in this world are broken people forgiven by the grace of Jesus? That's all he has. Every pastor you've ever heard preach is a broken, sinful person who's being redeemed by the grace of Jesus, saved by his grace, and trying to become more like him. God has no perfect people. The only one who walked on this earth who was perfect was Jesus, and he was crucified. Now God has us. But Lord, I'm not good enough. God says, but you know what? It's not about you. When Elisha looked at Elijah, he didn't, he didn't say, I got to become like Elijah. He said, I got to become like the God who leads Elijah. And that's what you should do. And can I give you a, a, a word, of a pastoral word? Don't ever, ever, ever make your life about following a pastor. Any pastor. Because every pastor will let you down at some point. We are human beings. We are broken. We are frail. And that's become very profoundly clear in the news in recent months and years. But it's true all through history. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. Elisha could learn from Elijah, but Elisha followed Yahweh. Everybody following that? 
You can learn from a pastor. I hope you do. But don't follow me and don't stake your faith and life on me or any other pastor because pastors are imperfect. And you get close enough, you'll discover that. If you're not sure, talk to my wife. Talk to Amy about Sean. You'll find out that we're not perfect. They'll probably be gracious and not say a whole lot, but they know. And so we follow Jesus. And, 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 and then we can just be distracted by lesser things. There's things that just fill up our day and fill up our time that we run around and do. And, and, I, and I believe that when you hear the call of Jesus, when you follow his leading, when you sacrifice whatever it takes to do what he calls you to do, well, here's what you're going to find out. The things you set down, the things you set aside, they are trinkets. They're worthless little, the little baubles and trinkets and toys of this world that we throw ourselves into. And God says, put that down. And follow me, and one day you'll look back and you're going to say, look what God did through the life of a person who just, a broken person who just sought to follow Jesus. When we look at this passage and look at Elisha's life, we continue to learn, we learn this, that Elisha knew following God meant leaving some things behind. He knew to follow God was to leave his parents behind. Let me kiss my father and mother goodbye. He understood, Elisha understood that there's things you say goodbye to when you follow Jesus. So here's the question. Why must we say goodbye if we're going to follow Jesus fully? Why do we have to learn? If you're going to follow Jesus, why do we have to learn to say goodbye? And here's the answer, because some things need to be left behind. If our arms are filled with certain things that we're holding on to, and we're going to grab the hand of Jesus and serve him, there's things we're going to have to just set down and say, you know what? I just, I'm letting it go. I'm leaving it behind. I'm saying goodbye. I'm saying goodbye to this habit or this attitude that has ruled my heart and my mind. Jealousy, bitterness, greed, whatever it is. Time to leave it in the rearview mirror. Man, time to drop it down. Time to come to God and say, God, this thing's got me captured. I'm going to say goodbye to this habit, this addiction that I've tried to say goodbye to 25 other times, and it keeps kind of knocking on the door saying, I want back in, and I open the door again. Man, maybe it's time to say, I've got to say goodbye another time. And keep saying goodbye until it's really gone. There's things we just have to say goodbye to. There's behaviors that we have to say goodbye to, attitudes we have to say goodbye to. There's sometimes there's people to truly follow Jesus that we have to say goodbye to. Now, he wants us to shine his light so it's not walking away from the world, but there's times, or there's people when we start to follow Jesus that say goodbye to us. If you're going to live that way and be that way, I don't want to be in a relationship with you. I think of Nabil Qureshi, who was a dear friend of this congregation. Nabil Qureshi was a, a, a uh, devout Muslim who in seeking to understand who Allah was, he met Jesus and he became a Christian evangelist. He actually kind of looked at Shoreline as one of his primary spiritual homes and loved this church, preached here many times. He died of cancer some years back, stomach cancer in his early 30s. But when he became a follower of Jesus, he said goodbye to his family. Not because he wanted to, because they said, if you're going to follow Jesus, you can't be part of our family. For many years, he was basically cut off from his own family, who he loved dearly. But he had to decide, if I, followed, if I had to choose following Jesus or holding to my family, and I have to choose one, he took Jesus. And when you take hold of Jesus, there's things at times that get left behind. Painful, difficult, but part of the journey. And then as we look at Elisha, we learn that he gave up all security. He, he committed a public act of sacrificial devotion. Listen to verse 21. And just let in your mind, just ask yourself, what's going on here? His occupation, his life was farming. So we read verse 21. So Elisha left him and went back. He took his yoke of oxen and slaughtered them. He burned the plowing equi equipment to cook the meat. And gave it to the people, and they ate. Big community barbecue. Then he set out to follow Elijah and became his servant. What did he leave behind? What sacrifice did he make? His source of potential future wealth. His oxen were years and years and years of potential future wealth. He sacrificed them. His plowing equipment were the tools of his trade. He set them on fire and cooked the oxen on top of that. And then he fed it to the community. A public declaration and action. I'm living a new life. I'm leaving things behind. I'm starting fresh. That's one of the reasons I love baptism celebrations. 
Because the picture of a person going under the water, dying to sin and leaving their old life behind, and coming out of the water, new life, I'm following Jesus. If you've never been baptized and you're a Christian, I challenge you the next time you do a baptism class, sign up for it. There is something about publicly saying, my old life is over. And even if you've been a Christian a long time, that moment when you're baptized, there's a, there, that locks in your mind. I have died to sin. I'm risen in the power of Jesus. We move forward following Jesus, seeking him. And, and so Elisha, his potential future wealth, he sacrifices it. Tools of the trade, he burns them. Does it publicly so everybody sees. So here's the question. What have you sacrificed And what still needs to be placed on the altar? What have you sacrificed? What have you laid down? And if you look back and see, you'll look back over time and say, what I thought was this great sacrifice compared to what God has done, it's nothing. Man, that's nothing. Compared to what God does through a person who lays their life down to follow Jesus. And what do you still need to sacrifice? What might God be saying to you right now It's time to give up this habit, this pattern, this behavior, this hobby, this neutral thing that consumes my time so I can truly follow Jesus. If you look at your life right now and say, I don't feel like there's any sacrifice or really, I'm not, there's no cost or sacrifice to my faith. Here's my question. Are you really following Jesus? How closely are you following Jesus? Because when you follow the crucified Lord, You follow the one who said, if you want to be my follower, deny yourself every day, take up the cross, be willing to die, and follow me. I remember almost 30 years ago, I hit a crossroads. Sharon and I hit a crossroads in our lives. At the time, our boys were about four years old, two years old, and newborn. So young, small family. Working full-time in the church. I was in the the process of doing my doctoral program, working full-time in the church, had a wonderful wife, three kids. We had this very busy, full life. And God opened a door to to do some writing for a Christian publisher. Had an opportunity to write a study in the Gospel of John, another study in the book of Ephesians that would be used by people all over the place. And the publisher said to me, could you do this? I had to look at my life and say, what do I give up? Because I had no spare time. And I realized I had, to, I had to find about 20 hours a week to do this writing project for a series of months. What I didn't know is that series of months would become 30 years of writing 20 hours a week. So I said, well, what do I give up? I looked at my life, and I found something. I found 20 hours. Not during my work time, not during my family time. In the evenings after the kids went to bed, I watched sports. I thought about sports. I followed sports. I... I can, get, I, can get involved, I can get excited about any sport. I remember one Winter Olympics getting captivated by women's curling. You know what that is? They take a big round rock with a handle on it. They push with these little special shoes. They push the rock and kind of spin it. And the other people, the little brooms, they go, wait, 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 make these noises. And they sweep and they knock other rocks around. I was excited about it. I was like, this is amazing. That's how much I can get caught up in sports. You get the picture? But when I looked at my life, I realized I could find about 20 hours a week not, I wouldn't stop playing some sports, but I would have to stop following basically almost all sports. Will you sacrifice this? Will you lay it down? I'm not talking to you. I'm saying what God was saying to me. And looked at it, prayed about it, and made that decision. 30 years have gone by. I look back now. In 30 years, if you do the math, 20 hours a week, average over 30 years, we've written over 12 books, I think 12 books, over 120 small group study guides and hundreds of articles that are in Telugu, Hindi, uh, that are in Portuguese, uh, Mandarin Chinese, English, Spanish. Um, They're used all over the world. If you ask me now, Kevin, do you miss following sports the last 30 years? Here's what I would say. Sometimes. (laughs) I wish I could tell you no, but like when I'm around some guys and they're talking about who won the, the last world championship or this, I don't know. I'm not allowed to know because the minute I'm in it, I'm in it. So I've had to lay that on the altar. But if you ask me from my heart of hearts, has it been worth the sacrifice? I'd say that sacrifice was nothing compared to what God has done through it. I was talking with a pastor a while back who said to me, I want to start writing. How did you, how did you make time to write? I told him the story I just told you. He thought about it and he said, I guess I'll never be a writer. <laughs> so I, I, I said, you probably won't. But you, you have to choose. 
And just this last week, two different things God said to me, now this gets put on the altar. Now this gets things in my life that aren't bad things, but they're time-consuming things that God is telling me. And I'm not even sure what God's going to do with that time. I just know that God, and I know God is saying, Kevin, lay it down. Put that behind you. And one day you'll look back and you'll say, oh, that was worth it. I want God to do that for you. I want you to open your heart for that. So in two years and five years and 10 years, you'll look back and say, oh, what I thought was such a big sacrifice. It's a trinket. It's a toy. It's nothing compared to what God can do through a life of a person like Elisha. He's a farmer pushing a plow. And God says, I'm going to lead you. But to do it, you're going to have to lay some things down. What have you sacrificed and what still needs to be sacrificed? I want to invite you just to hear a couple of declarations. Would you say in your heart, it is all yours to God. It is all yours. You can have it all. I belong to you. That's an attitude that would set you up to surrender whatever you need to surrender. It is all yours. You can have it all. I belong to you. It is all yours. If you look at all the gifts, time, energy, abilities you have, all the resources you have, if you believe it's all his, say these words, it is all yours. You ready? It is all yours. If you believe that, say it again. At home, in the cars, ready? It is all yours. Now, if you're willing to say it, will you tell God, you can have it all. Ready? You can have it all. Say that again. You can have it all. And here's the bottom line. I belong to you. Say those words. I belong to to you. Say it again. I belong to you. If you believe that, you're posturing yourself to follow in a new and a fresh way. Elisha knew he was following God and not a person. This is so important. In 2 Kings chapter 2, Elisha had this understanding he wasn't following Elijah, he was following Yahweh, he was following God. God was using Elijah to mentor him, to train him. But, but we don't, we don't, as human beings, we don't follow other people as the ones who lead our lives. Jesus Christ leads our lives. He's with us. He's in us by his Holy Spirit. So when you get, when you get to uh, 2 Kings chapter 2, the story kind of continues on, and it's, it's fascinating. Uh, because in 2 Kings chapter 2, what happens is Elijah and Elisha are traveling, and Elisha knows, kind of by the Holy Spirit of God, he knows that Elijah... His time in ministry is coming to an end. He doesn't know what's going to happen, but God's going to actually sweep him away in a chariot of fire. He's going to disappear and be gone. And so if you read the second chapter of 2 Kings, what happens is they're traveling together, and they travel by walking different places. They're traveling, and, and, they're, and so Elijah says, I'm going to go to Bethel. I'm going to go to the city of Bethel. Elisha, you stay here. And Elisha says, no, I'm going where you go. So he follows him. They get there. And there's prophets there. And the prophets say to Elisha, Elisha, do you know, and I want to read this word for it. They, they basically, they say, you know, do you know that, that Elijah is going to be swept away? He's going to be gone. And I love Elisha's response. Yes, I know Elisha responded. This is verse 3 of 2 Kings 2. Yes, I know Elisha responded. So be quiet. Stop talking about it. I don't want to think about it. Just be quiet. And then they go to a next town, about a 15, there's, some of these walks are 15 mile walks. You know, they're talking and Elijah's training him, equipping him. He knows their time together is short. And they get to the next place and there's some prophets there. And again, that, that each of these three times, Elijah says, I'm going here. Wait here, Elisha. Elisha says, no, I'm staying with you. So he keeps following him. He's kind of on his heels. Where you go, I go. Each time they get there, there's some prophets say, hey, do you know that Elijah's going to be taken? Yes, I know. Be quiet. Don't talk about it. Happens again, again, again. Then they get to the Jordan River. And they get there, and, and Elisha is following Elijah. And Elijah rolls up his cloak when they get to the Jordan. And he takes it, and he strikes the Jordan River. Boom. And the waters part. The waters part. Now, remember, Elisha is a real human being. He's a real person. So if you could interpret the Hebrew and get exactly what's going on through, through Elisha's mind, at that moment when Elijah hits the water and parts, he's thinking something like this. Wow, that's really cool. Wouldn't you? Wouldn't you? If somebody hit the water and it parted, you'd be going, that's, man, that's incredible. That's amazing. They cross over on dry, dry land. On the hills nearby, there's a bunch of prophets watching. They watch Elijah and Elisha cross over. And on the other side, Elijah asks Elisha, 
Um, is there something you want? T -t -t Tell me one thing you want. And so they cross over, and, and Elijah says to Elisha, this is verse 9, Tell me, what can I do for you before I'm taken from you? So I'm going to be gone soon. What's the last thing I can do? Listen to these words. Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit, Elisha replied. You have asked a difficult thing, Elijah said. Yet if you see me when I'm taken from you, it will be yours. Otherwise, it will not. Keep your eyes on me. Right? So he says, what can I do for you? Ask one thing. He says, give me a double portion of your spirit. Now listen closely. Elisha is not being selfish. He's not asking for a bunch of, you know, bless me, bless me, bless me, God, give me lots of stuff. That's not the point. Elisha has walked with Elijah. He's watched him. He's seen his spirit, his love for God. He's not asking for double the power because the power is not Elijah's or Elisha's. The power is God's. He says, I want a double portion of your spirit. He, he, says, he says, the way that you love God, I would want to love God in a greater measure. Not in competition. As a matter of fact, in the ancient world, in, in, in the book of Deuteronomy, we're told that in the family, the firstborn son always got a double portion of the blessing, a double portion of the inheritance. It's like Elisha is saying, you're training me. You're my mentor. So even the Spirit of God is on you, and you walk with the spirit of passion and love for God and faithfulness. I want that so much. I want even more of that in my heart and my life. It's not an arrogant or selfish prayer. It's somebody saying, I want to love God, seek God, serve God, follow God in ways beyond what I can even commit, you know, imagine. And so then after this conversation, these chariots of fire come. Elijah is swept into heaven. Elisha sees it. And he's gone. And now Elisha's on his own. He looks, and Elijah's cloak is laying on the ground. So Elisha picks it up. You can try to imagine this moment. He walks to the Jordan. And he wonders, can the God of Elijah be my God? Can the power of the God of Elijah work through someone like Elisha? He was just a farmer a short time before. He's new to a lot of this stuff. He takes the cloak and he hits the water and it parts. And he walks across and he starts a new chapter of life. Who can God use? I believe God can use anybody Anybody who will say, God, when you speak, I'm ready to go. I'll pay attention. I'll listen. Anyone who will say, I'm willing to sacrifice because all I have is a gift from you, and God, I'm giving it back to you. As a matter of fact, I'm giving you all that I am. And I will give you a, as, as strong a biblical guarantee and promise as I can give you. If you will live your life like that, you will look back one day on your life, maybe on earth, maybe when you're in heaven. And you will see what God did through an ordinary person who he spoke to on an ordinary day who followed an extraordinary God and was willing to sacrifice. And I know in the next 24, 48 hours, there's going to be moments where God speaks to different people, maybe even right now, and says, it's time to leave this behind. It's time to give this up. It's time to sacrifice this to follow me. And you will have an opportunity. And so, Lord, this is our prayer, that we would follow you Lord, I pray that no person listening to this sermon today will ever say, I follow a pastor, I follow a teacher, I follow a person, but that we would say, I follow the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who died on the cross and rose again for me, and that we would follow you so much that we would be willing to sacrifice and give up anything you call us to, that we could do what you call us to do, be who you call us to be, go where you call us to go. Lord, may we leave things behind, may we set them down even if it's with tears, even if it's with pain, to follow you. And then, Lord, may you accomplish through us things we could never dream. And, Lord, in this life or from glory one day, may we look back and recognize that the trinkets and the toys and the things that we thought were so important that we laid down fade in the glory of what you can do through the life of a person who will follow you, whatever the cost. Give us courage as we seek to do that. We pray that in Jesus' glorious name. Amen. Amen. Before I send you off with a word of blessing, I want to give you a couple of invitations. 
And I want to uh, first invite you that if in the next three or four months you're transitioning away from Monterey, some of you will leave with the military, some of you will finish your schooling here and make a move, some of you are just making a move, your family's moving for some reason, and you'll be out of the area three to four months from now. We don't want you just to disappear. We want to bless you and pray over you and want to give you a little sending gift. We have a moment of sending. So if you're online and you want us to be able to bless you and pray over you and send you, at one o'clock today, go on our website, there's details there, join us for a sending time. And we'll actually send to you uh, what we're going to give to people here that are on campus. If you're on campus here in, in the parking lot or in the courtyard, and that's you, the next three or four months you're making a move, would you honor us by just joining us, just coming to the back here and where the welcome booth is with the balloons there? Is that, is that where we officially are? Okay, where the balloons are right there. Go right through the balloons there, and Pastor Roy will be there. Go talk with Pastor Roy. He wants to give you a coin that we've had made. On one side, it has our Shoreline logo. That's to remind you to pray for Shoreline. Wherever God sends you, pray for us. We need, we need your prayers. On the back of the coin... Is Acts chapter 1, 8, a verse in the Bible that says that you'll be my witnesses. You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. And actually, the first one of those they gave out was to Eric, who's sitting right here. And I remember when I gave you that coin, you looked at it and you said, I'm going to Jerusalem. Remember that? God was sending you guys to Jerusalem to military duty there, and, off, and we prayed over him. And... and I hope you still have that coin somewhere, and yep, and that reminds you. So, so one side is to remind you to pray for us. The other side is to remind you that God is sending you on mission, wherever you're going. It doesn't matter if your parents are sending you, if you're choosing this, if work is sending you, if the military is sending you. God's on the throne. He's sending you. We want to send you in his name to be a light and his witness wherever you go. And so online, 1 o'clock, uh, join us for ascending time. Here, go back there, and Pastor Roy will give you a coin, and then Sherry and I will also give you a book about how to share your faith Wherever God's leading you, we got a couple options you can choose from, and then we want to pray with you personally before you go, and we'll pray with other folks online. Then also, if today you really felt the Lord prompt you in some way to say, I want to take a next step of following him and laying things down and following Jesus, I want to challenge you, if you've never been in a spiritual gifts class and done a spiritual gifts self-assessment or assessment, uh, my wife Sherry <coughs> is leading a class at one o'clock today online. So if you're here, head home, get online, it's on the web, front of the website, and It'll be a class going through spiritual gifts. There's a little assessment you can do. And if you check a certain box, you don't have to. But if you say, I want to meet with someone face to face, we will meet with every single person who checks that box. We'll go over your, your spiritual gifts assessment and we'll talk to you about how you can take a next step of serving Jesus. It's so important. We will meet with every single person, doesn't matter, online, here, face to face, and help you on that journey of growing and following and serving Jesus. If you need prayer today, don't leave here without being prayed for. If you're on campus, Pastor Dennis and the team are right at the top of the stairs. They're waving. They're ready. They're excited to pray for you. So head right there. If you're at home, you're going to see, you can email your prayer need, and we'll put on a prayer list for our staff and our prayer team. We will pray for you. And if you call the number right there on your screen, excuse me, we will have somebody right now live pray with you and lift up whatever your need is. And then if you're new at Shoreline, uh, and you've not done this before, go to the Connection Center, which is also head back to the balloons, and they'll direct you where to go back there. And we want to give you a gift, and thank you for coming, answer your questions about Shoreline. And if you're at home, just text the word welcome to the number you see on the screen right there, and we will do the same thing. We will just interact with you online. And I want to keep encouraging you as we get towards Easter. Uh, to When you're ready, if you're at home and you're ready, I talked to two people this week who said, I'm ready to be back at church, but it's just so easy and comfortable being at home. Two people told me that. And in both cases, I said, okay, in the next couple of weeks, come back. If you're there for safety reasons, stay at home. But if you're able to in the coming weeks, start heading back this way because we're going to be gathering outdoors and indoors. We'll always stay online also and serve people there. But as you go from this place, will you walk with Jesus Christ? He took up the cross. He bore our sin and our shame. And he gave his life for us. And Jesus said, if you want to be my follower." Deny yourself every day. Take up the cross and follow me. So sacrifice and surrender whatever he calls you to. Go where he calls you to go. Do what he calls you to do. Love who he calls you to love. Serve who he calls you to serve. And you will look back one day and you will say, even when it's tough along the way, it was absolutely worth it.
Go and walk and live in the power of Jesus. God bless you. Have a great week. And join us back here online on campus next week for another sermon on Elisha. It will be powerful. We'll see you next week. God bless you.